The Unshackled Waves, episode 127. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the most concerning issues in Australia has been the use of the education system by the left to promote uh, cultural Marxist ideas and engage in the uh, social re-engineering and early sexualisation of children. Uh, this most famously began with the Safe Schools program designed by the Marxist academic Ros Ward promoting the LGBT agenda. It was thankfully defunded by the federal government but its influence still pervades the education curriculum, particularly in Victoria. Victoria is also where the Respectful Relationships Program was born, which was designed to supposedly counter domestic violence, but it's aimed at children as young as preschool to teach concepts such as male privilege and for older children includes discussions about pornography and various sexual encounters. Not surprisingly, there has been some pushback uh, from both parents and educators against the government overreach in these areas and concepts. Uh, one of those uh, teachers is Maura Deming, who uh, is a Melbourne-based parent and she teaches high school, who told the media she would refuse to teach what she described as the lurid content of safe schools and respectful relationships and would rather be fired. She and a number of other Melbourne mums have become politically active to fight these programs. Now, we haven't had a show that explores these programs in detail, so I thought it would be good to invite Moira on the show to do just that and how the fight back against them is going. Moira, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, obviously, this uh, concerning trend in our education system started with the uh, Safe Schools program, which was sold as an anti-bullying program. Now, it's it's begun to be uh, on the nose, both uh, federally and at various uh, state levels. The most state liberal parties seem to be behind abolishing it. And uh, Queensland uh, Labor, they claim that they don't teach safe schools and New South Wales uh, opposition leader Luke Foley said the program is uh, gone for good but you and me are both from uh, Victoria where we still have the full uh, version of uh, safe schools that was originally designed by uh, Ros Ward. So how is the, the program being managed at the moment? Uh, so Daniel Andrews has labelled uh, teachers like me and parents like me as bigots and he's you know, come out publicly and said that he'd prefer to listen to experts like Gary Dowsett and Ros Ward over people like me and ordinary parents. He's ignored the Loudoun report and he has included and fully funded um, the full program, um, which includes all uh, parts of the resources that were recommended to be removed. And uh, he's, you know, uh, taken it uh, inside the walls of the education department itself and started... Um, having new guidelines on, you know, mental health, student wellbeing, which incorporate the principles and the safe schools programs, gender fluidity, all that kind of thing. So he's actually really entrenched everything in the program that people are worried about. Now, when the original Safe Schools document was uh, closely scrutinised, the uh, All of Us, uh, and it was first reported, I think, in the Australian, the, we were first told, you know, what was actually in it. It wasn't just an anti-bullying program. And one of the things was the, you know, students were forced to do, you know, role-playing, uh, pretend, you know, uh, pretending to be, you know, LGBT students and, you know, like, uh, you know, thinking... Uh, as them. Can you uh, go into detail about, you know, what what that involved in the classroom level? Yeah, so there were teacher resources. There are lots of them that you can choose to use in your classroom, uh, which have either conversation starters where you can assign kids to read out and pretend to be one of the, you know, a dozen uh, types of sexuality or gender characters. Um, and so I can just read you a few quotes with a few problems in them as I see them. So you remember the age, especially often it starts in year seven. So uh, there's one for year seven students at age 11 or 12, uh, which are told to role play being 16 years old and in a same sex relationship with someone that they're really into 
Now you've got to remember this is inevitably going to be a sexual conversation, um, which is totally inappropriate. Um, there's one uh, example of a 16-year-old who has begun ha who began having sex at age 13. And there's no mention of statutory rape in that educational material, which I would have thought you would definitely cover. Um, but there's this comment from this particular character that says, it's nobody else's business if I like sex. Um, and that's the kind of thing they have to read out. That's the kind of thing they have to, they have to imagine being that person. Um, there's a 17-year-old girl who has had 15 sexual partners of various genders. Uh, there's, there's heaps of them. Um, and that's not something that has been done before. You know, when we read books in English, we read about a character um, and, you know, and obviously these are age-appropriate books, not like this. This would be with older year levels. You might have someone who was raped, like in To Kill a Mockingbird, and you would talk about it in third person. You would not ask a student to publicly talk about how it would feel to be raped or to be having sex with X, Y, Z person or anything like that. You wouldn't be uh, making it personal and public in the classroom like that for a student. I, I think lots of students would be very uncomfortable with these role plays. Uh, probably what disturbed me most about the the program was its politically charged uh, uh, content, where it uh, basically you know instructs students that they should be you know allies of you know LGBT people and encourages encourages them to lobby on their behalf. Yes, it talks a lot about you know how to stand up um, against transphobia, uh, but of course transphobia, you know. That's uh, a politically charged word. And, uh, you know, there's no room for disagreement in this curriculum. Nowhere in there are little uh, vignettes where a person who uh, perhaps doesn't agree with, uh, you know, transgender theory is talking to a transgender person and that they can have a respectful discussion. There's nothing like that in there. That's what I was expecting to read and I didn't find that anywhere. Uh, people who disagree with that are portrayed as, you know, religious nutters. Um, you know, there's also, you know, good religious people who agree with it all, um, or old fashioned or just hateful and how to stand up to them. And most of it is, uh, you know, it does, it uses that language of how to be an ally. It doesn't say the word enemy, but it's implied, isn't it? Um, and it really does, you know, create these caricatures of people who would disagree as unintelligent and hateful. You know, and needing to be stood up to instead of just having a conversation. There's nothing in here that is about um, building relationships with people who you might disagree with, about sexual ethics, about gender identity. There's nothing about building bridges between, you know, those, inevitably you're going to have groups of kids on either side. And there's nothing in there to help teachers actually build bridges between those kids. It's the opposite. It's how to stand up and squash the other person's or the other side's uh, point of view and how to drown it out. So they have things like posters, they have, you know, colour your school purple or rainbow, you know, there's all this high visibility stuff so that everyone can see immediately who's not on board with this agenda because they're not wearing the right colour, they're not doing the right activities. It's, uh, it makes it very, very hard to uh, be someone who disagrees and not necessarily publicise it because everyone's going to know. It's really, um, it's really very unusual, a lot of the material. Uh, in the uh, public debate about safe schools, there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, gender theory. Can you explain for our audience what exactly that is and what's uh, taught in it? Yes. Uh, so in the curriculum, uh, sometimes it seems to contradict itself. Uh, they basically say that gender is a choice. So what I was expecting to read when I went and had a look at this material for myself was that gender dysphoria would be presented like any other medical condition. You would get some statistics, you would find out it was very rare, it was very, you know, a very difficult condition for someone to have and that we should treat them with compassion. These are their treatment options, you know, and perhaps, you know, these are some of the controversies that our society needs to deal with at the moment, like toilets and bathrooms and things like that. Um, that wasn't in there. Um, gender is now presented for all students as a choice and a choice um, a wonderful choice, a happy choice, a choice that you can make literally from hour to hour or day, day to day or hour to hour, it said. You can change your mind. As if there are no consequences to changing your gender, to thinking that you can change your gender, to thinking that feeling like you're not um, a super masculine male or a super feminine female, 
that you must be transgender. So it's actually put on a scale and you have, you know, masculine male over here and feminine female over here. And just it gives you the distinct impression that anything that is not, you know, an absolute, uh, you know, himbo or a bimbo basically is going to be transgender. I would have thought I was transgender looking at this. I think so many, I think most people would fall in the middle of this spectrum and inevitably be led to thinking that uh, they might not be uh, a boy or a girl, they might be something in the middle just because they don't fit a stereotype. It's very, very confusing. It's not, and it's presented as a fact, it's not presented as a theory. I don't like, you know, I don't like the way that it's presented. I don't like it that it's presented so early and I don't like that uh, it's presented as a fact. It's not presented as a social sciences theory, which is where it came from. It's just a philosophy. You know, it hasn't been proven. There's no biological science behind it. So. Uh, boys and girls are already, you know, told these days they can uh, do anything and there's you know, no need to, you know, confuse that with, you know, concepts such as this. That's right. It actually uses stereotypes to undermine a child's sense of their own uh, gender identity, you know, that aligns with their biological sex when they weren't questioning it before. Girls, you know, my girls who played sport, who played soccer, who played football, they didn't think that they weren't real girls. My boys uh, who were in the chess club or we had some who were dancers, we had, we had one who was really into movies and acting and he loved putting on the makeup and he loved being a villain or he'd be anything, girl, boy, whatever, he just loved that. And he didn't think he was not a real man or not a boy, not a male because of that. He just knew that he had those particular interests. They weren't stereotyping themselves. They were free. And now they're going to be re-imprisoned uh, in, uh, in these stereotypes or being transgender, which is ridiculous. You don't want your kid coming home from school and saying, well, you know, I'll, you know, if you read the descriptions of how did you know you were transgender, you know, they've got these stories from the students who are transgender. Oh, from a young age, I liked playing with girls' toys and I liked pink. That doesn't mean that you're not a boy. Pink is not a boy's colour. Pink is just a colour, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's madness, you know, in terms of it contradicts itself, saying that it's, you know, we've got to get rid of stereotypes. But then the whole thing is predicated on stereotypes. So, and I, I think kids will notice this eventually. I think they're definitely going to be putting some challenging questions out there to teachers if they've got the guts. And it's also uh, encouraged schools to adopt uh, gender-neutral bathrooms, which is, you know, it's, or, it's already, uh, you know, controversial just in the, the public at large to, you know, put them in schools. That's, you know, taking it to an even further extreme. Yeah, that's right. It actually says on uh, the education site, careful consideration should be given to the use of facilities that are appropriate to the student's preferred or chosen gender. Um, well, they're going to be forced to let kids use whichever bathroom they want. And if you think that children don't exist who would abuse that privilege just to sexually harass and leer and invade the private spaces of uh, kids of the opposite gender, I just think you don't know enough kids. Um, and the other thing that really bugs me is they're only ever talking about students. And they usually use an example of a primary school student, you know, uh, whereas I teach high school, and I can tell you right now, it's, it's a very rare kind of a student that would do that, but they do exist. And what about teachers? You know, the thing that really concerns me is the male teacher who suddenly identifies as female and wants to go and supervise all your daughters in the change room at the swimming carnival. And I'm not comfortable with that. I know that my female students would often not be comfortable with that. And how are they going to speak up? You know, how are they... How are they going to say, I don't feel comfortable with this? They're not allowed to not feel comfortable with it. Because as I've already said, people who aren't allies that are hateful and bigoted. And um, I just think it's going to increase the anxiety of students just astronomically. You know, on camps, you know, because of uh, student privacy, often parents aren't being told until the kids get back that, oh, we had a boy stay in our room, you know, because he's transgender or you know, thinks he's a female, however the student would describe it, and mum and dad are, you know, upset about that, justifiably. Um, there are so many uh, complications from this policy, you know, and there's no bar for it. There's no bar, not only in schools, but in wider society. You know, you don't have to have had uh, finished your surgery, so you can be a fully intact male 
in a change room with girls so, and saying that you're a woman um, and demanding that they accept you and they treat you like you would treat another girl and that if you don't, you must somehow be a really hateful person when really they're not going to understand why they're uncomfortable, but they just will be. You know, and then there'll be no one that they can talk to about it with, without being tarred and feathered. Um, you know, I just, I foresee some really horrible, horrible consequences from this and I don't think it's been thought through. And, that, you know, if they were going to do it at all, the bar should be extremely high. You should have been completely finished transitioning at the very least, in my opinion. And there's also been some media reports that schools can actually uh, take it upon themselves to help a child uh, transition. Is that actually true? Yes. So, uh, so there's a guide for teachers called Guide to Supporting a Student to Affirm or Transition Gender Identity at School. So what that involves is, so just say I have a male student who's decided he's a female now, and we can provide that boy with a female school uniform. We can be instructed to call him by a new chosen name and whatever pronouns that that child wishes. Now, this is all without a medical diagnosis. Or parental consent. So the booklet actually states, if a student does not have family or care or support for this process, dot dot dot, a few other things in the middle, it may be possible to consider a student a mature minor and able to make decisions without parental consent. So can you imagine me at parent-teacher interviews sitting there with the boy who's now dressed as a boy because his parents are there, calling him by his boy name and withholding all that information from the parents who I am actually, you know, in my mind, they're the people that I really work for, basically deceiving and lying to these parents about a massively important psychological um, process that their child is going through. You know, and teachers are not psychologists. Teachers are not doctors. Calling a child a mature minor, that's a legal term. You know, this is very serious stuff. Parents are not... Uh, and not having, you know, they're not being respected in this program at all. And I think that's one of the, want... the most disturbing aspects of these programs is that it seems to want to keep, you know, parents in the dark about, you know, uh, you know, all of, you know, what's going on at school and even in this extreme uh, case here. Yeah, yeah. And you think if it's such a massive deal and you want families, um, to get on board, then you'd have a parent information night or you'd do something to um, restore or mediate a relationship between parents and their students. You'd refer them to outside psychological help. You'd refer them to the Royal Children's Hospital um, together as a family. You'd do all kinds of things. But the last thing I ever expected to read was that you can go behind the parents' backs. And in fact, you are expected to go behind the parents' backs and support a child to transition to a different uh, gender without telling them and to keep it from them. And you just imagine that coupled with the doctors and schools program where they can then get actual proper medical treatment. Again, it uses the mature minor language. So if you are deemed a mature minor by that doctor, you can start, you know, hormones or anything behind the parent's back. I mean, I think that's disgraceful. And I do not want to be keeping that lie going. I will not lie to the parents of my students. I won't do it. I can't believe I'm being encouraged to do it in that material. What a disgrace. Now in Victoria, we don't just have safe schools. We also have a program called uh, Respectful Relationships, which is uh, was a response to the uh, domestic uh, violence uh, uh, Royal Commission, um, which in, in some respects is um, even worse than uh, safe schools. and. Uh, How's it like? Because obviously it's you know solved. You know if you you know don't uh, don't support this, you're you know not serious about uh, solving domestic violence. Uh, if it had much in there about domestic violence, uh, and if the content in there that was about domestic violence wasn't so political, you know I would take it more seriously and I would support it. But uh, again, it just reads as a sex education manual, and. Uh, in terms of domestic violence, again, it's very it's presented in a political manner. It, uh, without any uh, proper foundation in terms of statistics and research, um, it you know lays the blame for domestic violence at the feet of mostly males, and you know says that you know the disrespect you know from kinder on onwards between males and females is you know is the 
the thing that we need to squash. Um, you know, when really there are so many other aspects to domestic violence, like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, you know, and there are female domestic violence abusers. And, you know, you're going to have kids in your classroom who know that actually it's mum at our house. Uh, and who, how's that kid going to speak up? You know, it's, uh, it's very one-sided and I just think kids are going to get very confused uh, by it as well. So again, it just reads like a sex ed manual and a, um, a gender fluidity teaching manual to me as well. Uh, and that's probably the, the most disturbing aspect is that it's aimed at children so young that, you know, like, you know, boys, uh, you know, age four, you know, they haven't, you know, done anything. They're just, you know, busy, uh, you know, just uh, enjoying their childhood, yet they're, you know, f forced on these, you know, concepts such as, you know, male um, uh, privilege and uh, also that, you know, girls are, you know, told to sort of, you know, look out for, you know, aspects of, you know, discrimination. Yeah. And they're not going to be able to understand it to the level that uh, is clearly desired in the curriculum anyway. Uh, you know, why wouldn't we just use sentences like, you know, unfair and fair? Or, well, you know, again, you know, that's one of the examples people roll out for, to praise respectful relationships and say, you know, we know these days that, you know, girls can be fire, met fire people, firefighters and boys can be ballerinas. It's like, when in the last 20 years did anyone say that that wasn't true? Where are these horrible adults telling the children that they can only be this or that if they're a boy or a girl? I've never met a teacher like this, you know? It's, I don't, it's from a different era. They're attacking a different era. No one's saying that stuff anymore anyway. It's just an excuse, as far as I can see, to get all this ridiculous uh, sexuality education into extremely um, early education, which is, yeah, as, you said, I find respectful relationships even more disturbing than safe schools because of the age of the kids involved, yeah. And it also uh, contains uh, sexually charged uh, content as well. There's, uh, you know, scenarios about, you know, what, um, you know, people should do in uh, sexual situations, which, you know, can be quite confronting to, um, you know, many children. Uh, can you explain those and also uh, just uh, state, you know, what ages this is aimed at? Uh, so respectful relationships is primary school, but also kinder. So, uh, and I think it can go into middle school in some um, areas. So. This was one of the most telling sentences for me when I uh, was reading through it. It said, sexuality is how people feel and express themselves as sexual beings. Sexuality is an integral part of life. It starts at birth and only ends when we die. Now, they're not talking about biological sex. They are talking about erotic sex, and I can prove it. Here's another quote. Sexual play is a normal part of child, of child development in every society. In the primary years, it may include simulated intercourse with clothes on. No, that's something that I have to mandatorily report as a possible sign of child abuse. Um, another one is, if a primary school aged child, this is from earlychildhoodaustralia.org. This is a recommended resource. It's called Pants Aren't Rude, some kind of a textbook or book or something for teachers, for early childhood educators. I've only seen it online, but here's a quote from it. If a primary school aged child asks what is a clitoris, answer with a little round bump about as big as a pea, which is just above the opening to where the wear comes out. It feels good when you touch it. Can you imagine any parent being comfortable with any adult saying that to their child? What kind of a teacher would say that? Who would say that? Why would a child, you know, it's just, it makes no sense. I've signed contracts. Every teacher would have signed contracts pledging, you know, to keep a professional boundary between them and their students. And this is just destroying it. Children are not going to know who are the safe adults that are allowed to talk to me about my body and show me pictures of my private parts. You know, because mum and dad at home are saying it's just us and the doctor if we're there. You know, mum and, mums and dads are on top of this mostly. You know, we've, you know we're all awake to the you know, the dangers of pedophiles, and we're all telling our children that these areas are private, they're not for anyone to talk about, they're not to show you yours, you're not to show them, you know, your, um, 
They're not to show you yours, you're not to show them that yours. I can talk. You know what I mean. Um, but this children are, you know, parents aren't expecting this level of sexual content at primary school, let alone high school. And children aren't going to know that it's not normal for an adult to want to talk to them in graphic detail about their private parts. It's just going to ruin their safe boundaries, isn't it? They're not going to know when an actual sleeves bucket comes up to them and starts talking to them inappropriately that, oh, this shouldn't be happening because they'll think, well, my teacher at school did it, so it must be okay. Yeah, I think that, you know, engaging in, you know, because this is, you know, sexually you know, explicit language that probably, you know, that's, you know, just as, you know, traumatic for a child to hear than, you know, what it's supposedly protecting against. Yeah, exactly. And you never know what a child has been through. You know, if you look at the stats on, you know, how many kids in your classroom have been sexually abused, you know, as a high school teacher, I used, uh, the last one I read was, um, I think it was three out of 10 girls, and I can't remember the statistic for boys, but I always assumed that I had one or two kids in my class that had been seriously sexually abused at some stage in their life. And I was very careful. <sighs> about bringing things up for an extended period of time. Sometimes you could see kids getting uncomfortable. You know, this is just my experience in terms of, you know, um, from scenes in books like To Kill a Mockingbird. Like I had one girl who basically needed to leave every time we talked about the rape scene in that. You know, and then the court case was very traumatising for her. She just didn't want to be there. And that was totally fine. I just said, just don't even speak to me. Just get up and go. It's fine. You don't need to even, you know, explain yourself to me. She was very embarrassed about it. It was very difficult for her and you, we don't know how a primary school child is going to be able to articulate that to a teacher. I don't want to be in the room right now. I don't want to be here for this conversation. You know, younger children are so vulnerable. They don't have the language to articulate what they're feeling, what they need. Um, they're just going to be you know, anxious and upset. You know, and even when they get home, you know, how are they going to explain that to mum? How are they going to have the language to explain to mum they were talking about you know, all those things that happen to me, mum or dad. You know, sometimes the parents don't even know until later. There, There's lots of complicated issues here. It can open up a Pandora's box um, for a child and not and not actually help them to deal with it, you know. We don't know each child's background. Sometimes the parents choose to disclose it to the school. Sometimes they don't. Um, but, to, but to just bring this these topics up in such detail will be inevitably traumatizing for a whole bunch of the kids who have been abused without without doubt yeah, i think well definitely you know he hearing this and i'm sure most of our uh, listeners and viewers will think well that is you know that, that, that's an even too you know graphic discussion for me but you know who who are the people that actually think this is a you know good idea what's what's their actual you know reasoning and explanation for it apparently it's just called a sex positivity approach so you can read about it in United Nations documents, um, Canadian, American education documents. They say that if you don't uh, deal with sex in this level of detail, children will somehow be ashamed of it and uh, that this is going to stop them from getting abused because they will have all the language, you know, so they need... They need to know the, you know, the word clitoris. But, you know, they don't need to know the word clitoris. They need to know that this is a private area. So they can say, Mum, Dad, someone was talking to me or touching me in my private areas. Why do they need to know the word clitoris? And then if you rub it, it feels good. It's not going to stop them from getting abused. You know, it's silly. They don't need to know that much information. And telling them that it feels... Telling a primary school prepubescent child, you know, basically about masturbation... I mean, I think that's abuse. I think that's sexual harassment of a child. I, I am just flabbergasted about that one in particular. Um, you know, and all of this, as I said before, parents have no right to say no to. They have no right to know about it in detail. This is all, uh, you know, teachers' resources that I'm reading to. It's very hard for parents to find what I've found. Now, it's been denied that uh, safe schools and respectful relationships are uh, sex ed uh, programs, but I'd just like to get your view generally about, you know, sh is, you know, sexual education, you know, should it, should it be in schools? And if so, you know, what form should it take? So I don't have a problem with some basic sex ed, not at all. Um, I think... You know, it needs to be age appropriate. It needs to make sure 
that it doesn't cross over into um, those fringe areas of erot eroticism. I think that's inappropriate. So I think schools and teachers need to be really careful uh, not to breach that boundary. Um, so what we have been doing is we've been talking about, you know, it's just part of the cycle of life. Where do babies come from? Um, you cover STIs, how do they protect themselves? So lots of kids, in my experience, never knew that you could get STIs in your mouth. They just had no idea. Um, so yes, there are myths going around and I don't have a problem with, um, you know, some basic mature sex ed. Again, I would want parents to know when it's happening so that if there are follow-up questions and discussions that the kids want to have or, that if, you know, if they go home and they're a little bit, you know, they're just not themselves, the parents will know why. They can just say, hey, honey, what's going on? I heard you had this lesson today. Have you got any questions? Whatever it is, I just think we need to be in partnership with parents in schools. Um, when we're going to bring up a topic that could be upsetting for kids or a bit confronting, we should definitely be involving the parents so that they can just be prepared. Um, you know, they can support their kids as well. So I, I don't have a problem with sex ed on a basic level, as long as you've got parental consent and uh, you respect the student's boundaries. So you don't ask them to declare their sexuality publicly in class. You don't ask them to imagine and role play and talk about what it would feel like to be something, you know, some erotic uh, sexuality or something like that. You know, you just present the information to them and see if they've got any questions. That's different to what all of these programs do. They really force the children to uh, personally and publicly get involved in discussions in classes that I can tell you I don't think they'd want to be part of. Can I just uh, read you out something from a study? Yeah, sure. Uh, the study, it's sexuality, um, it's not all about sex. It's actually, it was actually made by a whole bunch of the contributors and supporters of the Safe Schools Respectful Relationships sort of cohort. You keep seeing their names coming up on the resources, so it's the, sort of the same um, bunch of people uh, from universities. So it's a study where students were asked to identify with whom they felt um, comfortable discussing sexual matters. Um, so obviously girls and boys both said their own same gender friends first, that was most highly. Mum ranked second for girls uh, and boys. Dad ranked third for boys and ninth for girls. Medical experts were pretty high for boys and girls, but the most interesting thing that I took from this, which is from their own material, these people pushing really, really explicit sex education in schools, uh, is that teachers were not ranked highly. Girls ranked them eighth, boys ranked them seventh, and when students were asked to rate with whom they felt uncomfortable discussing sexual matters, both boys and girls ranked teachers first. First. They don't want to have it forced on them. Kids want to choose who they talk to about this stuff. If they want to ask a particular teacher that they trust, they will. If their own parents aren't up for the discussion, kids aren't idiots. They usually have a, a you know a friend's mum that they can talk to, or a big sister, or a cousin, or even just an older friend at school. You know, they aren't without resources. You know, but they like to choose. What they don't like is having it forced forced on them publicly in classrooms. You know, they were uncomfortable when the um, classes weren't segregated by sex. They were uncomfortable, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But, it, you know, it really came down to the fact that kids want to ask. They do want the information, but they want to seek out people that they choose to put their trust in. And this, this whole sex positivity, whole school approach really forces it on all of them whether they like it or not, you know. It seems, so I just thought that was a really... It seems to have gone as sex ed uh, from, you know, teaching, you know, the basic facts about, you know, like, you know, sexual organs and, you know, we, we both agree that, you know, teaching about, you know, STIs is important. Um, but, but it seems to have gone yeah. from that to, you know, ba basically, you know, uh, uh, lessons about, you know, sexual, you know, experiences, you know, in, you know, instructing like students, like how, you know, to have sex and, you know, even like focusing on, you know, pleasure and things like that going into basic, you know, basically, you know, how, you know, you know, young people have, you know, sexual experience, which is, you know, that's, you know, completely, you know, their own business. And, you know, it's not related to, you know, the actual, you know, biological facts of sex. And the biggest problem from this, 
from my perspective as a teacher is that it really destroys those good and wise boundaries between teachers and students. So this kind of thing gives a sleaze bucket teacher, and we all know they're out there, legitimacy and legal cover to have a really leering conversation with kids who don't want to be having that conversation. You know, that's what I, I can see happening in a classroom. And you ask any kid who has been leered at by a teacher, they start with inappropriate conversations about this kind of thing. And this it's just going to give them cover. And there's going to be no... Uh, right, kids aren't going to feel like they have a right to put their hand up and say, you're not allowed to be talking to me about this. You shouldn't be saying this stuff to me. You shouldn't be asking me these questions. You shouldn't be telling me this information. You shouldn't be saying these words to me. I don't want you speaking... Um, about this stuff to me, you make me uncomfortable, they're not going to be allowed to say that. Even though this research that, you know, this Safe Schools Coalition uh, groupies have put out proves it, that they don't want to talk about it with teachers, they don't want to be forced to talk about it with teachers publicly as part of a classroom lesson. Um, kids are just losing all their rights to that to that space, that personal space between a teacher and a student. And it does, it's, it's, it's I just think the risks of uh, to all kids uh, are unacceptable because of this uh, material and it, it, it just uh, I don't understand you know why you know because uh, you know I grew up in like the the 90s and we seem to get you know the the balance right why there's been this need to you know basically take it to the next level and basically uh, you know turn sex ed into you know a, a discussion about you know but uh, you know, uh, you know, sexual uh, relations, like why Why has it gone this one step further? Well, all it is is pushing one particular uh, model of sexual ethics, and that is that anything, all sex is wonderful so long as it's consensual. And even then, I think the discussions in this material about consent are really, really lacking. Uh, and I don't think that most parents would agree with that, and I don't think that uh, the ramifications from even just, you know, consensual sex for a lot of these kids are going to be wonderful. I don't, you know, we all know that they're going to feel exploited. They're going to, uh, you know, lots of kids are going to feel exploited. Even if they did have consensual sex, they're going to feel regret. They're going to feel used and dirty and humiliated. And none of those kinds of things are dealt with properly in this material. It's all positive because you've got to have a sexuality positive, you know, sex, sex positive approach across the school. Um, and it really denies those experiences, as far as I can see in the material, that I think everybody knows are actually really common, especially for girls. Um, and it doesn't warn them about it properly, you know. And, you know, lots of parents, they would want their kids to wait, not necessarily till marriage, but they would want them to wait until they were perhaps a bit older. They would want them to wait until they were in a really strong relationship. They wouldn't want their kids sold this erotic adventure to go on that's got no consequences at all, kids, so long as you get regularly tested for STIs. That's the only warning that I could find in there. The only warning about sex that I could find in there was STIs are bad, but don't worry about it. They're not that bad because you just need to get tested. That was it. You know, the emotional impacts of uh, pornography, the, the addictive nature of pornography, um, you know, the questionable uh, morality of pornography, all of that, all of those wider ethical discussions are gone and it's all about sex being just wonderful and positive. And it is, but it, it isn't always, is it? There are heaps of situations where children aren't, well, it's children, I shouldn't even be saying children, they shouldn't be having sex, but, you know, where people don't find it to be something that they um, are happy that they did. And, you know, none of those discussions are there. And I just think that's that's just political. That's just pushing one view of sex on the kids and absolutely um, wiping out any other uh, perspectives on sex, like abstinence, if that's what a family wants to encourage for their children. You know, like waiting until, uh, I don't know, maybe even just 17 or just, or just waiting, just waiting, thinking about your virginity as something to hold on to. That's not in there. That's just, that's just an alien concept. It's not even there. But lots of people and lots of cultures and lots of families hold that view. And they would be surprised, I think, to see that this is a very political, one-sided um, promotion of a particular view on sex. 
which a lot of people don't even agree with, and they wouldn't feel comfortable being promoted to kids. Now, obviously, when you learned what was in these programs, you you took a, a, a brace down by going public in the media, saying that as a teacher you would you know refuse to uh, te teach this uh, content. Uh, uh, have there been? Have you spoken to many other parents who expressed a you know, similar uh, concern? Uh, most teachers I know feel exactly the same as I do about the parts of these programs that are inappropriate. Um, so on one level that's reassuring because they wouldn't bring this into the classroom. They could say they covered the sex, the you know, the safe schools material without covering these, um, you know, absurd parts. Um, but if you get a zealot teacher in there, you know, they're going to use all of this. Um, as for parents, I've had so many parents try to raise it with the schools and I've just had so many reports of parents being brushed off, um, having either been, you know, implied that they're hateful or ignorant, that they haven't read what they have clearly read. I had one mother, she was really uh, spoken to in a condescending manner by a principal and he regretted that because she came back in, uh, you know, with a stack uh, of resources and even he was shocked after that. and. Uh, went around asking the teachers, you know, and saying, don't teach this. He could see all these legal ramifications, you know, immediately from it that went against the guidelines that the school had. Um, so basically, uh, and parents have been picked on by other parents as well. If um, anybody finds out that they've been raising questions or that they're against particular aspects of it, there is um, vicious, vicious uh, backlash and no listening um, if you come out against it. So I've been called a homophobe, you know, just all the typical stuff, a transphobe, all that kind of thing, by people who have very clearly not read my articles, not listened to anything that I've actually said and have only been reading about me on, I don't know, social media somewhere. Or I don't even know why they would think I was homophobic if they'd read what I'd written because all of the children, all of my children, the gay children, the trans and all of the children that I would teach would be in greater danger because of these programs, in my opinion, because they can be sexually harassed, their boundaries can be invaded, um, you know, all the things that I said before. But, you know, oh, and you know, when I was interviewed by a few, uh, you know, Channel 10 and the Herald Sun and the Australian, actually, <laughs> Channel 10 was pretty fair, I've got to hand that to them. Um, but one of the other ones, um, she was just ringing me. Uh, to basically frame me as some kind of, you know, religious nutter in a cult or something, you know, some political party cult against gay people. Um, and she just wanted to... I realised after the phone call, I thought, why didn't she ask me for my evidence? I can prove everything that I've said is in the program. I've got it all down here. I don't want to lose my house. If I'm going to get taken to court, I've got all my evidence right here. I can prove everything that I've ever said. And I thought, why didn't she ask me for the evidence? And she didn't, and then, you know, she proceeded to slander me in the article as, you know, some kind of a bimbo who was just following some shadowy male. I don't even know what she was getting at. Um, you know, so there's not, no one's putting any effort in to actually find out why people like me are genuine about um, their concerns. There's no hate. It's genuine concern. It's genuine concern for all kids uh, and the way that this, these topics have been handled. But there's there's no... There's no fair questioning. Like I'd be perfectly willing to have a debate with someone or to lay out my evidence, but no one no one is asking for that. They're just saying, oh, do you disagree with it? I say yes, and they say, oh, you know, this one teacher, she just, you know, won't get on board with the anti-bullying program or something like that. So you do have to be, you know, if you're a parent or a teacher and you're against it, you, you have to be prepared for an amazing amount of backlash. And it's it's definitely a sign of the political climate, you know, that we're in. Like, if you, you know, don't toe the, you know, politically correct or, you know, socially acceptable line, uh, you know, you're, you know, described as, you know, whatever, uh, you know, bigot uh, under the sun. And so you definitely believe that's uh, deterred a lot of parents who are disturbed by the content from speaking out? Yeah, I've had, I mean... I thought I was going to get this tsunami of hate on Facebook uh, after I came out. And actually, I, I think I got, you know, I got a few hateful messages saying, you know, I hope your kids are going to be gay. And I thought, oh, you know, 
what, why, why, why would that matter to me? You know, I'm going to love my kids no matter what. You know, clearly they didn't know what they were talking about. But I just got a tsunami of support. I just, all these parents saying, thank you for speaking up or thank you for saying something, thank you for doing the research. They asked me, I started sending out my emails. I have this email with all these resources on it. And I just started emailing it to people. I'd say, well, you know, please keep my email address private, but I can send you, the, you know, the, the evidence. And all these random strangers um, were happy to uh, look up the evidence for themselves, and they were more than happy, and they were persuaded. Um, I only had one woman who wasn't persuaded, but I'm not convinced she even read what I sent her. Um, and she wanted me to be a bigot, and in the end she had to admit that I wasn't a bigot at the very least, so at least she stayed in the conversation for that long. Um, but, yeah, there's just there's, there's a big push to silence us, um, not listen to our concerns, not take on board our evidence, you know. And the thing I find amazing is, you know, I can prove that these uh, resources are in the doc, in the curriculum, but if if the Safe Schools Coalition, if, um, you know, Ros Ward and all of her friends uh, weren't ashamed of what they had put in there, why, why wouldn't they just say, yeah, it's in there, that's right, it's in there and it's right. Why aren't they just trying to persuade people of their point of view? They're not trying to persuade people of their point of view, they're hiding it. You know, I can't believe it. Even they know that it's not persuasive <laughs> and it wouldn't be persuasive for the majority of people. I've noticed myself in uh, my research that a lot of these you know, resources are being locked away. You have to you know, order them uh, through uh, website and sites and that. And luckily I've, you know, I've downloaded a lot of it before you know, it, it you know, disappeared. But it's, you know, if you're, like you said, if you're proud of these you know, programs, you know, what have you got to hide? Yeah, just argue your case, but that's not what they're doing. They're burying it, hiding it, rebranding it, taking branding, uh, uh, you know, taking branding off resources, rewording resources. Yeah, because they know that it's indefensible. And you would also think that, you know, if, um, you know, teachers at schools, you know, principals, you know, getting a lot of feedback from parents that, you know, we're really, uh, you know, concerned about, you know, what's seeing these uh, programs that, you know, that would filter back to, you know, the, you know, education department and, you know, the uh, politicians, but uh, that hasn't uh, proven to, to be the case. And so uh, a lot of, uh, you know, concerned parents and uh, teachers such as yourself have uh, got uh, politically active. You've joined the, the Liberal Party. Do you see that as the, basically the only way to try and fix this? Uh, I do now, yeah. So I went on record with uh, Channel 10 and the Herald Sun and I said, this was early on, um, before the Liberal Party had put out its official uh, policy to get rid of, uh, you know, these uh, very damaging curriculums. Um, but I said, and I was a member of the Liberal Party at the time, I said, if, if they support this program, I will, I'll leave the Liberal Party. It's, it's that important to me. I can't support a party that will... Um, put this kind of material into schools because I think it's so dangerous to kids. So, yes, I'm a member of the Liberal Party and I love their values and I'm really happy with Matthew Guy that he's taking on this fight even though there's so much misinformation uh, about it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's... Look, I'm just getting more and more politically active and I, I don't like the limelight. I don't like... You know, I'm fine talking in front of a bunch of teenagers actually don't relish the idea of uh, the public spotlight. I haven't enjoyed being called a homophobe, you know. I don't, uh, I'm not, you know, super combative like that. But, uh, you know, it's never ending, though. If they're going to go after kids, that's it. That's where I draw the line. If they're going to go after my children. I took my son out of kinder because they couldn't guarantee to me that they weren't going to uh, promote gender fluidity theory. I asked them directly. I sat them down for a meeting. I said, I don't believe in that. I don't think that's healthy to be telling children they can pick and choose their gender. Are you going to be running that? And they couldn't tell me no, so I, I took my son out of kinder. I, that was really sad for me. Um, but I'm not having my children, who have no gender dysphoria problems at all, suddenly, you know, coming home confused for no good reason. Um, so, yeah, the more I get involved in this, yes, I think, I think more and more people need to get politically involved. I think we need to join a political party. I think if you're a Labor Party supporter, Put some pressure on James Molino. Tell him that 
you know, the aspects of this program, like gender fluidity theory for everybody, instead of just supporting kids with gender dysphoria, is not okay. You know, erotic sex education is not okay. Sex ed is fine. You know, whatever political party that you lean towards, yes, put pressure on them. You know, this isn't, this shouldn't be uh, divided along party lines. You know, it's not just Liberal Party voters who, you know, want good boundaries for kids and teachers. It's not just. So just one party, we can, all of us parents can surely find the common ground in this and we can all be putting pressure on. For me, I've joined the party, I'm getting more and more active, my husband and I both. Um, so yeah, it is really important, I think, because, you know, who's going to listen to an actual teacher? Teachers aren't going to have any rights to say no to this, they're going to lose their jobs. Parents aren't going to have any rights to say no to this, they're going to say, well, go to another school or homeschool, you know, which is what I've heard a few times already. So I do think, I do think yeah, getting involved in politics is our best option at the moment. Well, it's a state election year here in Victoria as well, and it is you know, basically shaping up to be a referendum on safe schools because, as we already established, mm -hmm. Daniel Andrews is you know full steam ahead. Um, but it's good that um, yeah Matthew Guy and the Liberal opposition have you know said we you know will re remove this program. It's uh, and you know it seems that you know Victoria we've you know got the the worst of everything. Like the rest of the nation is you know moving away from it, but it seems uh, the fight's yeah. especially difficult here. Yeah. Yeah, we have an extreme uh, left left wing government. You know, I think I think Daniel Andrews has left most of those uh, uh, sort of middle middle Australian kind of political people behind. You know, they they're not they don't represent middle Australia anymore. Daniel Andrews does not represent ordinary middle Australians. Uh, you know, most of my family and friends actually vote Labor, and they agree with me on the particular parts of the program that I've outlined that are wrong, and I've shown them my evidence, and they agree with me, and it's. They can't believe that uh, that Labor has uh, become so extreme, but under Daniel Andrews, it really has. You know, he's really beholden to the Greens. I can barely tell the difference between Labor and the Greens anymore in Victoria. Well, Maura, yeah. I've appreciated you coming on the the show today and um, help, helping us uh, explore these uh, programs in uh, detail. It was certainly a confronting discussion at times, but uh, I'm grateful that you that took the time and uh, good luck in the fight for 2018. Thank you so much, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Please make sure that you join us at our next public event, which is the Free Speech Rally, hosted by the newly formed Australian Freedom of Speech Movement in Melbourne at the State Library of Victoria on February 24th at 1pm. It aims to take a stand against the stifling of free speech in Australia, both in our laws and through political correctness. So I hope that many of you can make it. Uh, tickets are still on sale for our friend Dave Palau's first major event, the Church and State Summit 2018, on the 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers, including Margaret Court and former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.